Hello, in this video I'm going to discuss a problem of induction and what I think can be done to solve it. The problem is largely attributed to David Hume and it's a problem of how we can justify predictions of the future based on past events. The sun has risen every morning for thousands of millions of years, but that doesn't mean that we know it will rise again tomorrow. How can we demonstrate that the past predicts the future without simply resorting to saying that it has worked in the past? Doing this would effectively be using inductive reasoning to prove that inductive reasoning works and so assuming our own conclusion. The problem is not really about certainty. If an event has taken place every day for many years, I don't think many people would use this to say with 100% certainty that it will happen again the next day. But I think most people would say that it probably will happen. But those arguing against inductive reasoning would argue that we cannot even say that an event is probable, let alone certain. But let's say you've never seen a swan before. You go out and see a hundred swans, and they are all white. Then you look for another swan, the 101st, to see what colour it is. You might want to say that it will probably be white. But is that the case, or could it equally be any other colour, black, orange, green? Here's where probability comes in. If you pick 101 random numbers between 0 and 1, then in the absence of any other information, the probability that the 101st of these numbers will be the lowest is 1 in 101. And you can apply it to real life situations as well. If you pick 101 people at random, then the probability that the 101st person will be the shortest is 1 in 101. And of course, if you pick 101 swans at random, then the probability that the 101st swan will be the least white is 1 in 101. But hold on, least white? Not all properties are on a continuous scale. Sometimes they are all or nothing. An object has, either has a property or it doesn't. Whiteness isn't necessarily an all or nothing thing anyway, but let's say that it is for now. In this case, we can just say that if an object is white, then it has a whiteness of 1, and if it isn't, then it has a whiteness of 0. In this case, we don't have a continuous scale, so unlike random numbers between 0 and 1 and people's heights, you are likely to get ties. Well, with more than 2, you will definitely get ties. But with ties, this actually reduces the probability of one of your sample being less white than all the others. But in general, ties or no ties, if you pick n objects at random, then the probability that the nth object will be the uniquely least x for some property x will be at most 1 in n, given no other information. The at most has to be present in cases where ties are possible. So back to our swans. The first hundred are white. Does this mean that the 101st swan has at most a 1 in 101 chance of being less white than the rest, and therefore at most a 1 in 101 chance of not being white? Not necessarily. Because by seeing that the first 100 swans are white, we no longer have no other information. We have the information that the first 100 swans are all white. And that does make a difference. For example, if you pick two objects at random, then the probability that the second of these is the least white is at most 1 in 2. So if you see that just one car and it's white, does this mean that the next car that you see has at least a 50% chance of also being white? I don't think we'd want to commit to that. It would mean that we'd have to say that the next car would have at least a 50% chance of being the same colour as the first, regardless of what colour it was, even if we define colour so finely that everything that we now call one colour becomes subdivided into a hundred different colour categories. We've picked out a specific property of this car, having already observed it. And we have to watch out for this in statistical tests. For example, you might want to find out if a dice is loaded. You roll it five times and it lands on two every time. You might say that the chances of that happening are 1 in 6 to the power of 5, or 1 in 7,776. In a sense, that's right. There is a 1 in 7,776 chance of getting five twos in a row from the start. But that's the same for any particular number, and what's so special about two? The chances of getting five of any number in a row are 1 in 6 to the power of 4, or 1 in 1,296. Still fairly unlikely, but not as unlikely as before. In statistical testing, you have to be able to establish a hypothesis before you can test for it. Your evidence for swans is really that the first hundred swans are all the same colour rather than that they are all white. Getting a hundred white swans in a row when you are testing for sameness of colour from the start is the same as getting just 99 swans in a row when you are specifically testing for whiteness from the start. Not that you were testing for sameness of colour right from the start. There are other properties of swans that you might have been looking out for too shape, size, how fast they can fly, how loud they are. So actually looking at it that way it's quite likely that one of the properties that you could have tested for would have been the same for the first quite, quite a few swans just by chance. So the fact that one of the properties remained constant for, was almost inevitable and not really evidence for anything. With lots of properties on offer 
that can reduce the size of the sample that you're allowed to use even further. So really you have to see enough swans for it to not be inevitable that you would get some constant property among, among the swans anyway, purely on the basis of the number of properties you might observe. Once you've reached that point and all the swans have still been white, you have a valid hypothesis and you can press on. Let's say, being fairly conservative, that you decide after 10 white swans that this is a reasonable hypothesis to take forward. Actually, to be fair, it would probably be less than this, but we'll go with this figure. You go on to observe 100 white swans in total, but 90 would be part of the statistical test. You can then reasonably declare that there is at least a 90-91 chance that the next swan will be white. Obviously, you have observed 90 swans, it's 90 nil, so you might be wondering why, it's, why it isn't a 90-90 chance. You have to go by the total number in the sample, including the one you're about to measure. This will be the 91st example. And with tyres allowed, this one has at most a 1 in 91 chance of being the least white, less white than the rest. In the same way, the 11th person into a room has a 1 in 11 chance of being the tallest. You wouldn't say that the tallest of the first 10 has a 10 in 10 chance of remaining so. And you can use that inductive logic for any property. But you have to use all the information you have. If you have specific reason to think that it might have been a fluke, then that is part of your evidence. If you have correctly guessed what side a coin will land on several times in a row, you might want to use inductive reasoning to work out how likely it is you'll guess correctly next time. But unlike the case of the white swans, you have specific reason to believe that this is probably a fluke. I said earlier that the probability of the 101st example of something being uniquely the least x for some property x is at most 1 in 101. But that's with no other information. All extra relevant information can contaminate this. In our example with the white swans, we changed it from at most 1 in 101 to at most 1 in 91. And that was with no particular reason to believe it was a fluke. So with predicting coins, you'd have to get a lot right to counteract the high prior probability that you have no particular coin toss guessing ability. Real life is messy and exact probabilities are hard to come by, but you can still validly reason inductively as long as you use all the information available. I just want to finish with one final example. Philo philosopher Nelson Goodman called this the new problem of induction. He defined two new terms, gru and blean. An object is gru if before time t it is green, or if after time t it is blue. An object is blean if before time t it is blue, or if after time t it is green. Let's say time t is midnight at the start of the 1st of January in the year 3000. So using gru blean language, everything that is currently green is also gru, and then everything that is currently blue is also blean. So while we might use our inductive logic to argue that objects will remain green or remain blue after the 1st of January 3000, those speaking the gru blean language might use their inductive logic to argue that objects will remain gru and blean, respectively. But we can't both be right. Either, objects, either green objects will become blue and blue objects green, or gru objects will become blue, blean and blean objects grew. Well, something else could happen entirely. But what reason have we got to think that we are right with our green and blue? Some have argued that the situation between our languages is symmetrical, but it is not. Grueness and blueness are not properties of the object, but are a function of a property of the object and time. Remaining grew or blean requires a change in an object on the 1st of January 3000. Some may argue that it's just a property of, of our language that makes us think that. But if you are out with someone who speaks the grew blean language at around midnight at the start of the year 3000 and you see a green object, you'd know instantly that it was green. Your friend would have to check their watch before saying whether it was grew or blean. When all this is factored in, we would, able to valid, we would be able to validly use inductive logic in a way that the grew blean people couldn't. And by the way, there's nothing special about time over any other property. You might be thinking that with either the Swan example or indeed the Grew Blean example, there are laws of physics that we don't know. Laws that could cause the colour of swans to change. And this could happen after the 100th swan. Yes, but we have no particular reason to think so. And we can factor that in from the start of our statistical test. When we have counted the first 10 swans to be white, included within that observation, is the fact that the laws of physics allow this to happen on 10 consecutive occasions. Something about time or time in conjunction with colour might change after that, but there is at most a 1 in 101 chance that the time colour laws will be at their most weird when making the 101st sworn observation given no other information. So that's it really. 
The point is that inductive reasoning does work. You can assign probabilities to events based on previous events, or at least probability ranges. But you have to take into account all of the ava available information. And the more relevant information you have, the more complicated the calculation becomes. But it is still a valid form of reasoning.